everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You're here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that are gonna help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is hard to fit in a box. He's the executive director of the Flow Genome Project and has been tapped to help unlock employee performance by Fortune 500 companies such as Cisco, Nike, Google, and Red Bull, but he's also well-versed in mystical experiences and Burning Man. Growing up, he took huge risks as an adventure athlete willing to risk everything for those fleeting moments where he was outside of himself and free of the monkey mind, but realizing how dangerous and clumsy of an approach that actually is he and partner Stephen Kotler have committed to delivering the elusive state of flow from the world of hard to reproduce mysticism to the world of hard science by mapping the genome of flow with scientific rigor by 2020. This endeavor has already made him the recognized expert in the $4 trillion altered states of consciousness economy and turned him into a much sought after speaker and consultant on the neurophysiology of ultimate human performance. You had me at ultimate human performance. His work ranges from advising high growth companies and hedge funds to running expeditionary leadership courses and helping optimize the most elite warriors on the planet. Half of the things that I came across in my research, I had to look up to fully understand. And every new thing I encountered made me feel like this guy is the ayahuasca spirit guide for an elevated and optimized daily life. Please. Help me in welcoming the co-author of the relentlessly intriguing book, Stealing Fire, how Silicon Valley, the Navy SEALs, and Maverick scientists are revolutionizing the way we live and work. The midwife of transient hypofrontality himself, Jamie Wheel. Welcome. Thanks for having me, man. Good to see you again. Dude, good to see you as well. Very good to have you on the show. Um, I don't normally start with diving into terms and defining things, but I have a feeling where we're going to go by the end of this interview uh, is going to get pretty interesting, maybe a little esoteric. So why don't we start with what are the states of altered consciousness? Sure. I mean, alter altered states of consciousness just means anything other than waking normal. And so that can include everything from dreams to visions to schizophrenic states, a whole broad swath. Mm. In, in our book, Stealing Fire, we actually kind of narrow that down. And we focus on what Johns Hopkins psychiatrist Stan Groff called non-ordinary states of consciousness. And under that, we, we zeroed in on three big categories. So meditation and mystical states. And, and in this case, um, you know, con classical sitting meditation, the kind of mm. thing that people are familiar with, but then also any of the states that are produced by dancing, by movement, by sexuality, by these days smart tech, you know, whether it's little things on your phone or more complex devices. So any of those states, flow states, which as we've discussed are, you know, those moments of in the zone performance, mm. again, typically for artists and athletes, and then psychedelic states. And there's been this recent renaissance in sanctioned research in, you know, chemicals that interact with our neurochemistry and produce very, very pronounced and fairly persistent uh, mm. different or altered states of consciousness. So, so that's the, those are the three, meditation, flow, and psychedelic states, under which we then had to kind of come up with a bigger name or term. And since, um, since the baby boomers and kind of hippies kind of ran a lot of them into the ground, <laughs> we were like, okay, we can't use any of that language. We have to right. wind the clock all the way back. So let's go all the way back to word origins, back to the ancient Greek. Mm. And we figured, okay, ecstasis, which in, in the Greek is the antecedent for the word ecstasy, right. which if you sort of get beyond the club drug reference, is this sort of just means literally that which moves us beyond ourselves. Right. So non-ordinary states are those that typically take us out of everyday waking consciousness, where I am self-aware and have an inner narrative going on, to those states beyond that. Right. And then there's a whole host of additional qualities we can talk about. You've likened the inner narrative to our inner Woody Allen. Yeah. Which, uh, I found that, yeah, that, that's exactly what it feels like, right? Someone who's <laughs> essentially heckling you within your own life, Yeah. Uh, which is painful to know that it's coming from your own mind, which I, how much do you know about like what they've done with severing the corpus callosum and creating literal duality in people's minds? Yeah, I mean, I think that's some uh, Sam Harris in his book, Waking Us, 
talks about that. I think it's one of the most fascinating parts of that book. Um, and, and I think that it gives us a great, you know, just empirical kind of A-B testing on what do we think of as ourselves and to what extent is our consciousness or conscious waking part, the part that can point to stuff and name it and call it out, actually calling the show. Right. And actually neuroscientist David Eagleman, who's, who's a dear friend of ours and on our advisory board, he teaches at Stanford. Mm. Um, he's done, in his book, Incognito, and several of his others, he makes that great case too. He's like, look, basically our conscious mind is no more than the headlines on the Sunday edition of the New York <laughs> Times, you know, compared to the right. entire week's news. Mm. And so that fact that what we think of as ourselves and what we're actually in real time able to name, point out and talk about is, you know, a percent at most of all the data we're experiencing, all the sensations and inputs, is you know, fascinating and, and or terrifying, depending on your point of view, right. and potentially liberating. Because if we can get access to more of that bitstream, and we can integrate it into our choices, our decisions, and, and, and even our inspiration, we have access to a lot more bandwidth. It's like going from dial-up to fiber optic in a heartbeat. Mm. Is that why this has become sort of your life's work? I mean, I think, <laughs> maybe, maybe on a sort of like cognitive level, on a, like an intellectual level, mm. but really it's, it's become my life's work because I just realized it's the only thing that makes me tick. It's the only thing that gets me up out of bed in the morning. We, we, have, a, we have a sort of inside joke, the first rule of flow clubs, you never talk about flow club. Like, don't, <laughs> don't talk about it. Just go do it, live it, shut up, right. you know? Like, and, and so for me, I just realized I'm a lazy, unmotivated bastard when it comes down to it. You and me both. Bam! There it is. And, and so I just noticed that, and I'm like, wow. And then I noticed everybody else too, which was it felt like we're drowning in information and we're starving for motivation. So like new ideas about you know, 10, top 10 listicles about how to live better or be more productive and all that right. kind of stuff, I think there's, there's a sort of false promise there. Because like, that's not the weak link. The weak link is, do I have enough drive in myself to do these things? And if we can unlock intrinsic motivation, if right. we can unlock that I can't help but go do this because it, it, it fulfills me, and we can connect that to long-term development, then I think we got something much more potent and potentially transformative than post-it notes or affirmations. Uh, talk to me about the four trillion dollar um, economy that's grown up around people's desire to mess with their own bearing chemistry. Yeah, I mean this, this is kind of a crazy story actually because we had mapped the, you know, the neurobiology of the flow state. You know, that's, that's the genome of the flow kind of part of our organization. And so we realized, ah, when you're in 21st century normal, it has a very consistent signature. It's fast beta brain waves, it's prefrontal cortical activity, a lot of kind of just fight or flight stress hormones, but they're just kind of left on slow drip. So norepinephrine and cortisol. Our heart, not surprisingly, our heart, our heart rate variability is kind of all over the place. Jaggedy look like the stock market instead of a nice sine wave, right? Our postures are often hunched. Our respiration is partial and shallow. Poor air exchange, pulled up CO2, brain's not getting fully oxygenated. Like there's this kind of predictable stack. Mm. And when we feel like most of us feel most of the time, it looks like that under the hood. And alternately, in these non-ordinary states, all of that stuff shifts, and it shifts kind of, you know, to the right, at least on a sort of nominal two by two chart of it, right. and it becomes slower brain waves, alpha or theta, it becomes um, deactivated or hyperactivated brain activity in different regions lighting up and turning off. It requires neurotransmitters that flush out the stress chemicals and replace them with reward and feel good chemicals, dopamine, endorphins, anandamide, those kinds of things. Um, respiration tends to become more relaxed and belly breathing. You get better air exchange. Posture tends to follow. Shoulders relax and fall back, head above, you know, head above shoulders, all these kind of things. You're like, wow. So that's an interesting signature. And what we realized was this actually applies not just to flow states. This applies to meditative states. This applies to other mystically induced states. This applies to psychedelic states. And we realized, okay, now we've got almost a Rosetta Stone. You know, if you remember like back, back in when I think it was Napoleon's era, they discovered that tablet mm. that had Greek, Demotic Greek and Egyptian hieroglyphs all saying the same sentence all in one place. So they could translate and they could decode the grammar of it. Right. right, and that unlocked access to these languages that had been hidden. Well, you know, and that, that genome of flow became our Rosetta Stone, and it let us unlock, we were like, oh, well, 
you know, flow states were the domain of artists and athletes, and meditative states were the domains of, you know, mystics and meditators, or sort of saints, you know, pious folk, monks, and then psychedelics were sort of hippies and ravers. Right. <laughs> and, and none of those communities would ever talk to each other. They'd walk past each other on the street and not bat an eye. And we're like, oh, well, wait a sec. Actually, your practices, the doors you're going through are all completely different, but the place you're getting to, remarkably similar. Right. So as soon as we had that insight, we're like, okay, well, let's see. Are we full of it? Or is this just a hypothesis that doesn't bear out? And we said, let's, let's actually do a hard economic analysis and let's take a look at how much time and money are people spending seeking those, those states, that profile, that signature. Right. And so we backed into it and we took a look at the obvious, licit and illicit pharmaceuticals. So everything from alcohol, tobacco, nicotine, all the way over to you know, legal and illegal marijuana, all the way to on, on and off prescription pharmaceuticals, Oxycontin, painkillers, psychiatric meds, that whole neck of the woods. Right. That was over $2.2 trillion. Right, just, just alone. And then we went into you know, not just you know, compounds that we can ingest to shift our state, but the entire psychotherapeutic self-help space, help me get, coach me, or right. teach me to get out of my waking state consciousness, feel happier, et cetera. And that was billions more. And then we took a look at immersive media. The idea of immersive media, I mean, we talked about IMAX, we talked about even just binge watching, right? I mean, Netflix has done all their algorithms and the idea of like even the fact that the next show pops up before the last one finishes is like they've right. coded it and they've even found that like comedies aren't that good for binge watching but what is is serial dramas mm -hmm. so that's why house of cards like wow. give because i'm now hung up on a cliffhanger right. i can't wait to have the dopamine hit of the reward yeah. of the next thing and i'll stay up yeah. i thought i was just going to watch one and go to bed six of them later <laughs> it's 3 a.m and i'm still going to go for that last son of a bitch to get my payoff right. right so so those are all the categories and we realized like imax you know, giant 40 foot screens, huge subwoofers, mm. right? The ability to be in the dark. I've lost, not unlike a sensory deprivation tank, but I've, I lose the boundaries of myself. I'm connected to other people who are, you know, booing and gasping and clapping and cheering. Right. The sound, you know, George Lucas, right, famously said, you know, he said movies are 50% audio. Mm. <laughs> right, and so huge sound, huge screens. We travel further, we pay more for those tickets. We don't just stream them at home or go to our local Cineplex. Right. So that's a state shifting choice we pay a premium for. And you said something about that, you were like, we don't uh, go that far out of our way and pay the additional mm -hmm. premium for to see better movies. We go there to feel something more. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's the premise or payoff of IMAX. You like lose yourself more, right? Right, and for two or three hours, project onto the screen, mirror neurons, all the kind of thing. I mean, our brains aren't evolutionarily wired to distinguish between what's on a screen and what's we, we're actually perceiving right. through our own sure. eyes. That's why that those initial silent movies with the train coming and everyone bailed out of their seats, right? right. Um, so that's that's the premise of IMAX um, binge watching. We've just talked about, and you know that notion of it gets out of hand, right? I I planned one, I ended up right. watching eight. Right, that, that's a sign of the neurochem happening. Streaming pornography is a great example because if you think about it, why do we do it? There's no evolutionary payoff. If I succeed at watching porn, <laughs> right, I do not propagate the gene pool one bit. Right. But what I do do is I create a state of pronounced physiological arousal right, and a, neuro, and a state of sated neurochemistry that I find appealing. Right. And, and if you think about that one, you know, like, um, there's, a, there's a book um, called Salt, Sugar, Fat by a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, New York Times author. Mm. He basically talks about how the food industry has hacked what they call the bliss point. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. and they literally, I mean, they schemed for it. And this is why we have chilies and TGI Fridays and the Cheesecake Factory, right? And they basically figured out that salt, sugar, and fat were both very, all three, rare sensations. Salt, essential mineral, you can only get it at salt licks in certain places. Um, sugar, you know, was only available in berry season for two weeks. No refrigerators, no shipping, right? right? Two weeks of berry season or a honeycomb, and that was it. Right, and fat, easy to spoil. Right. So anytime it's in our evolutionary history we had access to that stuff, it was just like the signal was just get as much as you can while you can. Right, and now we can't stop. We can't turn it off. So you get two Krispy Kremes between a bacon cheeseburger, and that's a thing, man. Right? That <laughs> exists in the world, believe it or not. And people cannot, people lose their minds. Right. And, 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 and so, and 70% of adult American men are obese. Right? That's crazy. Right? And so, and so you put sexuality in that same category, mm -hmm. right? So food, water, sex, three prime, you know, primary evolutionary drivers. And now we have untapped access to perennially sexually available mates with no contest from peers. Right. Because we provided access to all this stuff now in ways that were never, ever available. Right. People have no checks and balances anymore. 
So the ability to massively overshoot the market in pursuing these states mm. is absolutely there and it's a clear and present danger. So all things- Do you think all things, we need checks and balances? I mean, I think the evidence would suggest that without them, if we just provide unlimited access mm. to things that used to have natural ebbs and flows, you tend to get um, you tend to get excess and you tend to get addiction, destruction, and distraction. Let's talk about drugs. So here's the thing, I'm soup, I'm a total wuss about drugs. So I don't do drugs. I've tried smoking weed, I fucking hated it. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, drink, but super occasionally, like I just don't mess exogenously with my uh, neurochemistry very often. Yeah. I'm terrified of psychedelics, but I'm so intrigued by what lies on the other side. Like, uh -huh. One, do you think it's, it's a, uh, I'm gonna say necessary doorway. Uh -huh. um, is it a massive accelerator and why should it or shouldn't it be more readily used by people? Okay, that's a bunch of questions. That's a lot of questions. Okay, so, so I mean, first things first. Um, if there's a premise for our book at all that I would want people to take away, it's that the door matters less than the destination. Okay. Right? And so- But aren't some doors gonna be easier than others? Some, and yeah, I mean, we even talk about it in, in one of the later chapters, which is like literally the ecstasis equation. Because people always ask us, what's the best way? Yeah, like, yeah for hey, sure. Oh, trust me, know, that's what, on the list of questions. What's today, the best way? And we're like, look, man, it depends. It depends on your time frames, your risk tolerance. My time frame, how long I have to get into yeah, this Yeah, like, how, I mean, because if you, if you wanted to say, hey, I'm risk averse, Yep. Right, I have all the time in the world, right, and I want the safest, surest way. I'd say dedicate, you know, respiration practice and contemplation. Go forth and have fun, right? And see me in ten years. If you're like, I am desperate to have some meaning. Like, let's take for instance a specific case study of a, a Iraqi vet who's suffering from PTSD. Yeah, perfect. Right, so, yep. I mean, so like you've got time, time, money, and, and excess, and you can choose your path and you're risk averse, go learn to meditate, right? Yep. Um, I'm not sure if I can live another day in my mind yeah. the way it is, then stronger interventions may be necessary. And in fact, uh, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, has, has been doing federally profound, federally sanctioned research with trauma sufferers. Mm. So it is, it's, uh, you know, war veterans as well as sufferers of childhood abuse and sexual abuse. So folks who life has happened to them in ways that are unfair, mm. unsustainable, and the burden of that wounding is, is literally killing them. And in as little as one session with MDMA, and for those folks that don't know, that, that's, that's the core pharmaceutical agreement and what folks often know as ecstasy right. or molly. Um, and when you ingest it, it interacts with your serotonin system and it also, reduce, it also uh, releases dopamine and oxytocin. So you've got serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin coming into your system and it tends to leave people uh, feeling, particularly if they have been traumatized, they can relax, they can feel safe, they can feel secure, and they're basically having the ability to go and revisit those traumatic events in ways that don't trigger their nervous system into fight or flight again. And in conjunction with skilled therapeutic talk therapy, um, the ability for that to release them. I mean, in fact, one, it actually, it's been so successful, it's been screwing up their stats. Because they, stats? Uh, the maps, as mm -hmm. they do this research, because the protocol was for three sessions to stretch over six, week, uh, six months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a, there's been more than one. One Iraqi vet, he's like, I did one, one session, I'm good. Wow. Save my life, I'm not coming back. MDMA. Yeah, but in conjunction with talk therapy, talk therapy very supervised, very supervised and very structured. Johns Hopkins University is doing studies, NYU is doing studies, UCLA is doing studies, and MAPS, the multidisciplinary, so maps.org, you can check in on those websites. Um, the good news is, is that their evidence has been so overwhelmingly power, you know, pronounced, effective, that the FDA is approving it not just for trauma, but also for anxiety and depression. Wow. And that's now in stage three clinical trials, I believe, like, how does the brain rewire that fast? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And it doesn't just happen. Um, I, the short answer is I don't know why or how it does, mm. but I would say that it does. Um, and it's not just pharmaceutical intervention. So the MDMA trauma stuff, actually, if you wind that story back, it first began in the 1990s with Willoughby Britton at Brown University, and she was studying NDE survivors, so near-death experience mm. folks. And she was like, look, I'm a trauma, I'm a trauma researcher. When people are traumatized, that's usually a bad thing for them. 
Right. But people who have had the kind of tunnel of white light yeah. breakthrough epiphany moments come back and the thing that should have traumatized them actually leaves them happier than ever. And she measured that with time it takes to get into REM sleep. And this, this is just an interesting notion. So back to your point about like a conscious just mind. Just chills. Yeah. I didn't realize there was something measurable out of this. Oh my God, it's crazy. So like back to that notion of like conscious mind is just the top 1%. Yeah. You can test how long does it take me to go and fall into REM sleep at night and predict with clinical accuracy, whether or not I'm gonna be depressed six months from now. Wow. Yeah, so like, I, I won't even feel depressed yet. Mm. Six months from now, I'm gonna be in the dumps, feeling that the world is at me and I don't like my relationships and my job sucks. But six months earlier, you can tell me that by, hey, psst, it's taking you, you're, you're dropping into REM sleep too early. So basically, less than 100 minutes, less than 60 minutes, if I drop into REM, total clinical sign, I'm gonna be depressed. So not how fast later. you fall asleep. No, no. How so, fast you go into REM. Yeah, and the sooner I go into REM, actually, the more, that, that's more of a risk factor. The longer, really? yeah, the longer it takes me to get into REM. So here's the fact, is that 90, 90 minutes is about average. NDE survivors were clicking it over 100 to 110, 120 minutes before mm. they dropped in REM. And brain scans were showing that their neurology, their neural networks were, were permanently rewired as a result of that singular cathartic Jesus. experience. So you're like, what is going on here? Mm. So, so the, obviously the trouble with NDE studies is you can't repeat them in a lab. You can't nearly kill people to see if cool stuff happens. Can't you? Yeah, right? So, so Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins had a sort of slightly more elegant solution. So like, well, we can't, like, NDEs are accidental roll of the dice, so we can't yeah. schedule that. Um, and how do we find more people that are truly facing mortality? Right. And, and how, can we recreate this in some way? So he basically took terminal cancer patients and introduced three grams of psilocybin. It was enough that people got to an interesting place, but not so much that they had to manage wild and woolly experiences. Right. And, and, you know, four, four out of 10 reported it being the most meaningful experience of their lives, wow. period. Just straight up, most meaningful thing I've ever done. Um, and I think seven or eight out of 10 said it was top five. And the results were persistent for one month, three month, six month, basically as long as they continue right. to survey them. So then why don't people do more? Like Steve Jobs, right? So uh -huh. For real though, like that would be my question. So, and that is the reason that I don't do it because my assumption is that the answer is because that shit is dangerous, mm. right? That there's one of the chapters in your book is called burning down the house, right? So we stole fire from the gods and we do all this amazing stuff with it, but uh -huh. we can also burn down the house. Yeah. And so I guess it fascinates me with drugs because if I knew it were safe, I would do it. So where is that like critical threshold? Why isn't anybody, um, and, and I was gonna say Steve Jobs said everyone should do it once, but he didn't say everyone should do it weekly or daily, uh -huh. right? So what is it that makes people back off? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's, you know, what we, there's, a, there's several different things. So one, let's, we gotta just refine our terms because drugs is a bit of a clumsy category. Fair. Right? So um, we're not talking about amphetamines. We're not talking about cocaine. We're not talking about opioids and heroin and any of those things. We're talking about an incredibly specific and refined subset mm. of psychedelics of which the, you know, most of the ones we're talking about interact with the serotonin system specifically. Okay. Okay? So that specific category, right, is fairly unique in its properties. Right, and, the, and may have, and, and has some of the benefits as well as known issues that you have to be very mindful of, but they're not physically addictive, there's very low ability to physically overdose, any of those kind of things are not on the table for this specific category. Right. Right. Um, that said, there are, you know, state-sanctioned states of consciousness, there always have been. Right, and whether it's, you know, whether it's way back in the days of the Catholic Church, you know, in fact, even like Neolithic era, right, if you look at early cave sites in Western Europe, you have burned hemp seeds and mortars and pestles for opium, for poppy seeds, right? No alcohol. The alcohol complex, as anthropologists kind of call a cultural movement, began around the Mediterranean. So I mean, even those Old Testament stories like Noah and fermented grapes and all that kind of stuff, right? right? So alcohol complex began there and, and funnily enough, fueled a warlike and nomadic bunch of people that migrated out of the Mediterranean and the alcohol complex kind of took over Europe mm. in interesting ways, right? So we enforce, I mean, even today, the smoke break, the coffee break and happy hour. Right? We enforce those even though on considered rankings of most harmful substances that are broadly used, alcohol is number one. It, ta it beats heroin. Heroin's number what? two. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alcohol is social harm. Say social what? Absolutely. No question about it. Ethanol, other than the fact that it's so deeply enculturated and we love to raise a glass and there's all these wonderful and, and bajillions amounts of film, TV, right. advertising that reinforces it. Yeah. 
Ethanol sucks. Is anyone looking at the brain while they're doing this? Like what? Yeah, exactly. So, so Robin Carhart Harris, Imperial College of London, has just in the last three years started using LSD with patients to put them through fMRI. So now I can precipitate the experience with world-class measurement devices. Right. And what he found was two things, really interesting. So the first was, is that our ego, when people talk about ego disintegration, and you're, you're like practitioners, they was actually right. Like our ego is not, there's not a single spot where it lives, it's a network. And if you knock out even one or two of those nodes, the whole thing boop, powers down. And what are you and shutting we, down, the prefrontal cortex, is that? Well, it's, 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 it's subtler and more nuanced than that mm -hmm. these days. And that's, that's what's so cool. Like the, the new tech is advancing and our ability to put people in right. interesting states while under the measurement devices, because these are big, giant, million dollar machines. Yeah. The first thing is that the ego is a network and that destabilizing or knocking out even a couple of nodes will shut the whole thing down. You'll get that moment of selflessness. Woody Allen goes away, that stuff. But the other, and this is goes, you know, goes back to why Fadiman's microdosing was so interesting is that is that um, under those under those conditions, right? While your brain is actually metabolizing and neurotransmitting LSD around its circuitry, and the serotonin is happening, you're getting connections between parts of your brain that normally never talk to each other. What creates that connection? So it's not going to be myelination, right? That happens too slowly. So what what? is the mechanism there? Well, I mean, I think in that literal sense, it's probably neurotransmitters. And it's probably literally the serotonin systems. There's a couple, several Just different receptor sites. distant regions. Firing and talking to each other, and they normally don't. Right. So it's sort of like skip level neighbors calling out the window, right? Yeah. And it's like, and, and those far flung connections, I mean, that literally is the mind expansion element. And it's super practical. See, this is the thing. It's not just like, oh, wow, I've never thought, you know, that a, that a, that a tree, that an oak tree comes from an acorn, you know, mind blown, you know, it's like, it's like, can I work on real hard stuff that's in my life that has practical applications, real world constraints? And can I navigate through Do you know some of the this? things that the patentable stuff that came out of that? Like, are there yeah, door gates, release? linear electron beam accelerators, like like hardcore, wow. super high tech stuff? Wow. Yeah, and of course, I mean that's the are those guys but, still doing it? That's my real. Yeah, everybody's obsession. doing it. I mean, bottom line is Silicon Valley. When we go up there and we speak to teams of engineers, and we're like, here's flow states, and here's ways to manage your day, and, and they're like, Psst, hey man, our whole engineering team's <laughs> microdosing. What do you think about that? And I'm like, really? Right. And we're like, uh, can we talk about this <laughs> off campus? <laughs> um, so, you know, so the bottom line is like, um, yes, yeah, Sil Silicon Valley as just exemplar or emblem mm. of a lot of this stuff, there's, there's a lot of executives that are using transcranial magnetic stimulation. So that, yeah, okay, right, so, so that, now that doesn't freak me out. Exactly, so, so I, I recommend TMS to everybody right. that's interested in it, because it's like, okay, if you are risk averse. So tell people what that is. So transcranial magnetic stimulation, yep. it almost looks like one of those, uh, the mirrors, you know, those lights that dentists have in their offices, mm -hmm. you know, and you can line it up over the front of your brain, and, you, and it basically sends magnetic pulses through what whatever part of your brain you target. And the right. typical way they do it is they kind of test it and they make, you know, like you'll just end up with a sort of natural response, like grab your thumb and they're like, okay, now it's over the right zone. And they just do 15 to 20 minute sessions on a daily basis. And it basically just defrags your cognitive hard drive. And it's FDA approved for depression, okay. which is what they, you know, obviously largest target market. Let's go ahead and go through those hoops. Um, and it performs at like 70, it's, it's 2X as effective as Prozac. Um, and uh, it's basically like a month long protocol. Now, not that many insurers will pay for it. So it's spendy, right. 15 to 20K for a, for a batch. So that's mm. prohibitive, but a lot of people are using it off label. Mm. And so what they're finding is that, is that by basically kind of pulsing it with magnetic activity and then sort of level setting all of your neuronal connections right. when they power back up, it's almost just like a cold, you know, it's just like a hard reboot on your computer that's been on yeah. too long. Um, you end up with cleaner pathways and connections and greater efficacy. So that's being used off-label by a lot of executives. Um, it's also being used by colleagues of How ours. How hard do they shut down? Um, it depends, but one of them is dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so you can absolutely target that. And, and other colleagues of ours that are doing DARPA research, mm -hmm. right? Target acquisition with snipers, archery, all these kind of measurable things. How long does it take you to learn stuff? They're using it to basically mechanically induce a flow state. Yeah. So rather than saying, hey, you've got to roll the dice or spin the tumbler and get lucky, they're just saying, hey, sit here, boosh, one session, you've got 20 to 40 minutes where you're not going to be your normal self. <laughs> right and go crush it and see how fast you learn stuff and the acceleration and learning in those instances was up to 490 percent what was the name of the company that's doing that um advanced brain monitoring has been one yeah. of them for sure give the stats on how much faster you can learn a language it goes from like uh six, six months, months to, to six, six weeks? weeks yeah yeah that's crazy so what what are they doing in the brain to get you in that state and why does it allow you to learn so much faster because reading that in the book mm -hmm. i was like 
Jamie and I are going to this place. They're going to zap me and we're going to learn something really, really fast. If nothing else, I want to advance my Greek. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. let's go. Yeah, I mean, the, the simplest thing that those guys have been doing, and you can do this a thousand and one different ways, but is um, just straight up EEG feedback, so electrical activity. Mm -hmm. And can I, can I steer myself without... 20 years of meditation practice. Right, which, so biofeedback, and I'm watching biofeedback? my waves. Yeah. Can, and I, can I just use visualization of my actual real-time data to help me learn to control it faster? Yes, is the short answer. Right. right. So can I move out of distracted, fast-moving beta into something slower and more receptive, like alpha, theta? Have you seen people get themselves into gamma states? Um, yeah. Wow. Yes, and in fact, seasoned meditators, Tibetan lineage monks, mm -hmm. um, have a far higher spike in gamma um, than almost anybody else. And gamma waves, for the folks that don't know, that's like your eureka insight. That's right. the moment of like, shazam, I got it. And, and in fact, I just read a paper in Plus One, the journal, um, which was three different types of meditation and comparing the incidences of gamma frequency based on the different actual meditative styles. So they're not just like, can it be done? And not just can, and meditators can do it, but like now, which unique traditions do it better? And so the idea here is that um, by you know, you can either do it the old school way, yep. decades of practice, flying blind, but with or with you know lineage instruction, right? Or we can accelerate it now, and we can say, hey, can I use additional contemporary tools and tech, and can I accelerate my feedback loops, and can I start doing it faster? And once I can do that, um, it's not that, you know, the you know that that the I sort of just gain access to information I haven't learned or earned, but it is to say that I can put myself into the most receptive and accessible state possible to then go and do that. Do you work. think it's more important that, that it's learned and earned versus just being able to zap yourself or take a drug? Like for me, the idea of shaving 30 years, I don't care if people think it's cheating. Like, I'll shave yeah. 30 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's another one. We, we, you know, you asked, like, why doesn't everybody do this? In, this, in your right. case, the question was about pharmacological supplementation. But these days, it's getting into tech supplementation. It's getting into VR and AR. Right. right? The question is, is you know, the, what we talk about is the notion of the skin bag bias. The idea that, like, if it's inside my body and I've earned it, that's real yeah. and true. And if it comes from outside, it's cheating or shortcut and not real. Yeah. And the answer is just, really? You sure about that? Because you know, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, basically the moment you slow that down, you're like, okay, so where's the edges of that argument? You realize there are no edges. It's arbitrary and subjective. Right. And it's culturally, it's culturally ingrained. The reality is ours, we are clever monkeys making shit up all the time. And we're forever influencing ourselves. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, you go to yeah. Boulder and it's like goddamn Lake Wobegon. You know, you look at a Montessori class in Boulder and like all the kids are just perfect and beautiful. And then you see the mother and the father and they're all like 512 climbers slash pro cyclists slash mountaineer PhDs and they've self-selected, right? We all right. do this. We do it casually and informally. And then we also do it deliberately with, you know, with what we eat. We're tall. <laughs> you were tall now, and five, 500 years ago, we weren't. Um, we are constantly modifying ourselves. All right, let's get really crazy. Have you read Evolving Ourselves? No. Oh, oh, my friend, like you have to read it. So a big part of their whole thing is that natural selection doesn't exist anymore. Uh -huh. yeah. It is purely unnatural selection. 50% of the Earth's uh, dry land mass is um, covered by things that we have decided to let grow. So yes. whether that's wheat, corn, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. we've decided that. We've decided what species live and die. We're looking at ways to like bring back a woolly mammoth through cloning. It's like <laughs> literally yeah. we have taken over yeah. um, natural selection, what we've done to humans with the way that we impact our microbiome, our viome, uh, even just cesarean birth and how much yes. that impacts yes. a child. Head size. Yeah. Yeah. Having, um, Bigger head, smaller hips, having kids later, every five years over 35, I think that a woman pushes back having a child, it's a 14% increase in the likelihood that child will be obese. Uh, the heavier Ooh. you, the heavier the mother is, the more likely the child is to be obese. So it's like you get these generational stacks. They're talking yeah. about how um, epigenetic factors, so changes we make to our own environment, to ourselves now, can echo for four generations, yeah. which is fucking crazy. So if you take a rat, yep. zap his feet, and then make him smell almonds, uh -huh. then do nothing else, right? Yeah, yeah. One rat zapped his feet, made him smell almonds. His great-grandchildren will still be freaked out by the smell of almonds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, am I the only one freaking out about that? Like, that's, what? Yeah. Like, that is crazy. So we have completely taken this stuff over. So get, uh, that all triggered to me because this whole notion of whether it's internal, whether it's external, A, I don't think that we have grips on now, 
what is internal and external, whether it be height, intelligence, or whatever that we're already sort of taking control over and breeding in and out. God, that's a nasty word to say, but that's essentially what's happening. But now we're going to be taking over from a technological perspective, from a chemical perspective, and what are we going to be okay with altering, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What do you think? So, in fact, let's really get controversial, my friend. Okay. What do you think about performance-enhancing drugs? Well, I mean, the short answer is we've always been using them. Right, so you go back. You go back to the 1900s and the, uh, you know the early revival of the Olympics. They were do. They were. They were marathoners. Were having glasses of wine. Some of them were taking that would bumps help. of cocaine. That would help. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's <laughs> always been happening, right? I mean, the the the, in, the Incans had that highway that ran the strip of the Andes. It was like 11 or 1,200 miles. They would have their runners um, use dr basically freeze dried, literally, they'd leave it out at night and pound it, freeze dried potatoes and other stuff and coca leaves. And those sons of bitches were like the Pony Express on steroids. They could cover 1,100 Coke. miles in four days. Wow. Yeah, yeah, back in the day. Wow, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. So, so I mean, just, just absolutely out of hand. So the idea that there was some earlier, purer state mm. where none of this happened and we didn't modify anything is a is a fiction. Even go back to, oh, we use too much technology and we've been wounding the, hurting the environment. We need to get back to Mother Earth. Even the notion of just the primal old growth forest is a fiction. Right. So, I mean, fire has been used since Neolithic times by humans as a technology. It's arguably the most potent technology we've ever invented. So when Europeans came here in the 1600s and they're like, oh my gosh, there's game everywhere and there's park, park-like forest we can ride our horses through and the whole bit. No, no, Indians had been managing that landscape to promote game, you know, basically game husbandry for millennia before you guys showed up. Mm. So the idea that there is some earlier purer state is a pipe dream and a, and a false premise. We've always been modifying our environment. We've always been modifying ourselves. We've always been modifying the plants and foods we eat. Michael Pollan calls it the botany of desire, right? That we shape our plants and our plants shape us, right? right? They make us feel, and even including intoxicating plants, they make us feel good, therefore we make a time, we, we grow them, we help them have sex, we help them propagate, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it, it, is, it is us. We are clever monkeys with opposable thumbs and always have been. Um, but the notion of where is it going next because don't you think that right. it's accelerating? Like we're Mass doing it massively so rapidly. And like VR, even just take VR as an example, let, let alone like epigenetic manipulation and the kind of, you know, pick, mm. pick your child kind of stuff. But like even just VR, I mean, there's been studies now that are showing that people are getting VR hangovers when they take it off. And it's interfering with... What does that mean? Well, so, so like it, the first thing that people notice in VR is like, oh, this is weird and there's this lag and I get a little seasick. And they're, and they're improving latency and it's going to get better. But sure. that's the, that was the first thing. But now enough people are doing it and doing it, spending enough time in it that they're actually what's happening when people are spending a lot of time in it and taking off the headsets. And there's psychological depression. There's a what? sense of like the world is just flat and gray and I'm not yeah. like this superstar avatar slinging laser beams, yep. right? So this kind of sucks and I'm in stuck in traffic and you know, and my lunch is late. Um, and also like neurobiological. So like my visual system has been attuned to this simulated environment, but I'm not getting vestibular act inputs. I'm not getting proprioceptive inputs. It's all coming in through my retina. And then I take that off. My cerebellum is out of whack and people are literally getting sort of hangover effects. It's almost like when you've been on a boat too long and you get yeah, back on the pier yeah, and you have the sea legs, legs land legs. Yeah. People are getting like 3D legs when they come wow. back into waking state reality. So the question is, is, I mean, are we gonna end up just jacking ourselves involuntarily to the matrix, yeah. right? Instead of being in prison there ourselves. So here's my big fear. Have you read the comic um, DMZ? I don't think so. All right, so my mission in life is to get people to understand that fucking comic books contain like so much yeah. cultural wisdom. Because you don't have to actually produce it, right? You could do a hundred billion dollar budget movie and you just drawing, right? So whether you're drawing someone sitting in a living room or you're drawing something at the cosmological scale, it, it does not matter, right? Yeah. So they explore fascinating ideas. Yes. And the DMZ explores the notion of the US in the middle of its second civil war. And it is so unnerving now to read it now, it came out like probably 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more. Uh -huh. And at the time I felt a little insulated from mm -hmm. anything yeah, yeah. like that, but now it's getting a little bit crazy. How does what you guys are covering in Stealing Fire, because I think it does, touch on the divisiveness that we see, not just here in the US, but broader, like how do we use the technologies to transcend that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a massive, um, fascinating question. Um, and the, the simplest is to say, like, the, these techniques of ecstasy, which is Mucia Eliade's phrase from the University of Chicago way back when, but the notion of, like, technologies or tools we can use to 
create a prompt ecstasis or to step outside ourselves. Right. Right. Those can be used back to that, you know, 1984 Brave New World split. They can be used to, for our, the better angels of our nature, they can help us become more expansive, more creative, you know, heal trauma, prompt cooperation, collaboration, and innovation. Or they can use, be used to absolutely hijack our impulses and drives, push all of our pleasure seeking buttons, sell us more shit, you can leave us fat and happy and sated on the couch. Right. Yeah, the option is up to us. It's kind of like in Star Wars, right? I mean, like 100% force, Yoda, awesome. 80% force, Anakin, scary as hell. Right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so eight, eight, like ecstasis at 80% can be pretty much whatever the hell you want it to be. Right. Right. Fully expressed, it has these innumerable positive benefits. So. One of the questions, you know, there's that old Yeats line from that poem, The Second Coming, which kind of speaks a little bit to your DMZ comic, which is, the, you know, the, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are filled with a passionate intensity. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> right? The chills, that's really good. Yeah, what misshapen beast its hour come round at last lurches towards Bethlehem waiting to be born. Wow. And we have the ability through ecstasis to literally step beyond ourselves to have these experiences of expanded perspective, to have these experiences where we just get out of our own way. And we see, man, we are connected to each other. Man, love, beauty, truth are worth taking stands for. Basic decency. Like, there should be no reason why we can't reclaim honor, courage, duty, sacrifice, patriotism, democracy. Right? And it, this is not about left and right. This is about fear or love, right? And I think if, you know, if we think where we are today, like you can make a case, you don't have to buy into it, but like things are accelerating. A lot of people experience that. And it feels like everybody's mythologies are starting to smash and crash into each other, right? One group's savior is the other group's antichrist, right? And, and it's all happening, literally, like the Maitri. If you go on YouTube and you Google Maitri, the world teacher, which is the Buddhist world teacher, like there are Christian fundamentalists that are absolutely convinced that A, it might have been Obama, B, the Maitri is actually the Antichrist in drag, right? And you're like, what is going on? You know, and you've got the Matrix and you've got Star Wars and you've got, you know, Bannon and the alt-right, you've got ISIS, you've got all these real and imaginal narratives all getting swirled, sucked down the drain of time and space. And they're starting to slam into each other and blend and, and merge in a way that's overwhelming us. Because mm. we literally don't know whether to shit or go blind. And the reality is, it's like, what if all of that is just the skin of, it doesn't matter what flag you're flying, it doesn't matter what uniform you wear, the real separation is gonna be, are you coming from a place of love or are you coming from a place of fear and control? And these abilities to step outside ourselves, the abilities to see more, feel more, and know more is the chance to give the best some of their own conviction. That's where we are. It's like to have that courage to say enough, enough with the insanity, enough with the inhumanity. And it's not, it's not can, I, can I trip out? It's not can I skate from my life and responsibilities? It's can I just set my, down my burden long enough to step up to the high ground, to step up to the mountain and look around and say, I see where we are and I see what needs to be done. And, and it doesn't matter whether I get the prize. It doesn't matter whether my part is insignificant or pivotal. It's just that I have to play it. And if we all do that, and it's the tiniest little things, it's a smile at the grocery store, right? It's a nod to a neighbor. It's a conversation from a liberal to a conservative saying we both care about the same things. Let's honor democracy. Let's honor each other. This isn't complicated. And the ability to get beyond false schisms into a, a solution where you can hold more than one perspective. That is what ecstasis gives us. It gives us the ability to wake up to what's possible, to grow up and mend where we're broken, and to show up and do that which needs to be done. How do we get there at scale? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, there, 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 there's a short answer and there's a longer answer, but I think it's fundamentally open sourcing these techniques of ecstasy. We have the keys to our cage these days, right? We have the ability to, you know, get rid of neurotic Woody Allen. We really do. Like, the, that, that's imminently possible. We don't need to burn a lot of cycles wondering if we can. But the keys to our cage are the keys to the kingdom. It's the same thing. And so, and so yeah, meditate. I mean, all the smart tech, all the neuroscience, all these access points, all the information is here. Don't die wondering. Go find it.
and go find it with the fastest, cleanest, safest method that works for you. But go find it. Mm. And then let's go back to being people and let's go back to, to mending this world. All right, I have one more question for you, but first, where do these guys find you online? Well, I mean, the simplest right now is stealingfirebook.com. And our goal is to get this information out to everybody that needs it and really help support an open source revolution um, in, in con consciousness and culture. This stuff has always been mediated by middlemen and gatekeepers. Mm. And that's the most interesting thing. Right now, it's not one Spartacus, it's not one Prometheus. We're all Prometheus now. And by having this information and sharing it, um, that's my biggest hope. And I mean, I've, we've, we've run all the scenarios. I think there's a lot of ways this doesn't work. And I think the one way I can see it is a small band of dedicated rebels, <laughs> right? Doing the impossible just in time. Wow, that's awesome. All right, you've almost certainly touched on it, but put a fine point, what's the impact that you wanna have on the world? I mean, I think it's, it's sharing knowledge that people can use to wake themselves and each other up and live the fullest life possible without apology or compromise. I like that a lot. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. That was incredible. Guys, you're going to want to dig into this man's world. When I first encountered him, the first thought that I had was, this is the real life most interesting man in the world. The deeper that you go into the things that he's thinking about, the ways that he's explored it, we're going to have to bring him back because I didn't even get to like 10% <laughs> of the things that I wanted to ask him. You've got to hear him talk about relationships. It is unbelievable. We will get to that at some point. But guys, wow, that was uh, an incredible message. You're gonna wanna read the book, Stealing Fire. It goes into detail, the neuroscience, the hows, the whys, the wheres, about how you can actually achieve this stuff, the dangers, what awaits on the other side, all of that stuff, which I think warrants further exploration. It is such an intriguing book. I promise with every page that you turn, you're gonna be drawn farther into asking a question. You don't necessarily have to agree with the answer, um, but the, the argument that they're presenting I think is pretty undeniable that as Jamie said, we have the ability to step outside of our egocentric universe and really see things afresh. And whether that's to be able to have a breakthrough in your own business or whether that's to be able to see some of the political stuff that we're dealing with in a new light, to be able to see a new way forward, it doesn't matter. Those are all the things that are contained within the universe that can be affected, whether it's just straight up meditation or whether you're braver than I and you take the psychedelic route. Uh, but it's all there to be explored. So, boys and girls, if you haven't already, this is a weekly show, so be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Jamie, thank you so much. Man. Awesome. I really enjoyed that. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Impact Theory. If this content is adding value to your life, our one ask is that you go to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Not only does that help us build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about, but it also helps us get even more amazing guests on here to share their knowledge with all of us. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this community. And until next time, be legendary, my friends.